Welcome to our continuing series of virtual voices. Uh, today, our presenter is Laura Stein, who is the co-founder and CEO of BOMA Global. BOMA is an ancient African tradition of discussions on how to handle uh, the various projects that the tribe, is do, uh, tribe uh, of the African tribe is doing. Uh, it is a global network of local partners that is offering transformational learning experience to help us be more intentional and intelligent about the future we're creating. Prior to founding of BOMA, Laura was the executive director of Women's March Global, where she built the Women's March Global platform and oversaw all Women's March initiative outside of the US. And previous to that, she was the managing director of global development at Singularity University, responsible for Singularity University's global expansion and implementation of vision and strategy. And so over to you, Laura. And thank you everybody for joining. Um, as Christine said, um, my background is very much in the space of systems change. I actually grew up in uh, apartheid South Africa. And um, at that time, I saw the incredible amount of um, the challenges that a systemic change or sy a system can bring um, if it's not optimized um, to educate. And so a lot of the work I've done in my life has been around how do we create open systems and how do we deliver great education to um, every child on the planet. I spent the first part of my life um, or my career working for for-profit companies, often at the intersection of technology and education. And um, in the last 15 years, and probably what I was best known for is about 15 years ago, I started the TEDx movement, TED, and I, I started working for TEDx. I started working on one of the TED prizes called Pangea Day. Pangea Day was a wish made by a filmmaker. You may know her called Jahan Nujan, and her vision was to curate four hours of intense short movies that would change humans perspectives on the world and her job was to curate the movie and my job was to raise some of the money and get communities around the world to show up sort of like a super bowl of film watching around an intense four hours of documentaries after i had after we had um delivered pangea day the um ceo of ted asked me to stay on to try to help him work on how we could take the TED conference, which was a very small, highly produced conference out into the world. We'd had many um, heads of state and CEOs show up at our door wanting TED to come to their country. And so I spent some time working on a strategy, which having come out of the technology industry, having worked for Microsoft in the for-profit space and um, grown and taken public a series of consulting companies, I applied the values of the open source movement to this idea of a conference. and developed a strategy around um, what became TEDx. And TEDx, for those of you who don't know, and I'm sure some people have participated in a TEDx or even run a TEDx, but TEDx was a free license that you were given. Anybody could start their own TEDx. Um, and it was an event where you identified voices in your communities that were doing something interesting or different. And it was an opportunity to create an event that really highlighted local storytelling and innovation. And so I spent many years developing and building TEDx, building the platform to manage TEDx, building um, the framework for the 3000 events that ha happen around the world now, as well as the billions of views that have been seen from the uh, TEDx talks on the TED YouTube channel. And so TEDx was really the beginning of my venture into how do you create an open source system where the inputs from the community really drive the change we want to see in the world. Um, when I left TED, I'd sort of really taken it as far as I could take it inside of the TED framework, that, that is the TEDx um, platform and structure. And I was really working on the notion of how do we create sustainable circular systems? The TEDx license was a free license, but the people who ran the TEDx were also volunteers. 
And so it was very difficult for it, them to make TEDx their life work. And I really believed this on the, that we could create a system whereby we could create a framework that generated both profit and purpose. And so I was recruited by Peter Diamandes at Singularity University. And they had a really rabid community of people around the world who believed in this narrative of exponential technology. And so I thought it'd be an interesting way to evolve this notion of how do we balance profit and purpose? And I built out a framework for them, for their volunteers called chapters. There were about 160 chapters around the world. And then I was taking their consulting products around exponential technology um, into the world in a very decentralized way through my network of contacts that I had around the world that had helped me build TEDx and from previous networks that I had built um, around the world. And so through the Singularity brand, I was able to build on this notion of how do you really build something where you can drive both profit and purpose? And for example, they had done one event in their entire history. I built a framework and a licensing model for their exponential events. And by year, we were doing 12 events a year around the world, generating revenue for Singularity, which would then go to drive some of the impact work that we wanted to do in the world. Ultimately, um, while I love technology and I love the narrative of exponential technology, um, the narrative for me and for my value system was quite narrow. And so I decided that, you know, I really wanted to continue to do this work in the world where I was building systemic systems that would allow for systemic change. And but step back from singularity and decided that if I was going to try and build what I, I, I spent some time building a platform for the Women's March. But if I was going to try and build what would be almost a fourth global network that potentially I should do it from the ground up. And I connected with a series of individuals who had helped me build both singularity in their parts of the world, as well as TEDx in their parts of the world at a very high level. And we started um, working on a strategy around a framework of how do we create a decentralized network of local partners that could design an educational platform that would allow us to create a new operating system for humanity. That wasn't about top-down change, but there was a, co a combination of bottom-up and top-down change. And so through our year of strategizing, we ultimately two, and, two years ago launched BOMA um, BOMA is a decentralized network of local partners that is driving these educational, um, these educational strategies around how do we better um, educate future leaders and how do we intentionally and intelligently design a better future. And so we've been working on BOMA, as I said, for two years. And the original vision of BOMA was very much one of systems change around top down and bottom up change. We um, started off in three countries, we're now in nine countries. And um, pre-COVID, what was exciting is that we had launched um, our BOMA country partners in these nine countries, and they were delivering these large scale events around big global challenges. And these events, for example, we did one in New Zealand, it, they included all stakeholders. The one in New Zealand was on the future of food and food systems. And it was really about how do we bring everybody from the Minister of Agriculture to local regenerative um, farmers and, 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 and tribal wisdom to high school students along with us in an environment that was really focused on, on next generation innovation. So we had innovation labs and we were focused a lot on what happened after these events. And so we were doing a series of these around the world and some of the bigger global challenges. We did one in Germany on ethics, um, AI and the future of technology. Um, and we did one for future leaders in France and the second part of our BOMA country partners um, products that they were delivering was um, around how corporate training. So we went into companies and we worked with them on both what they need to be and who they need to, what they need to know and who they need to be to be future leaders. And um, we had our own bespoke curriculum and modules, but all this was being done in person. We were delivering it in person. And then finally, a week after Davos, we also launched our BOMA community, which was a bottom-up change. And you can think of this a little bit like TEDx, but focused on innovation and action. And we, did a, we launched it with a 3,000 person event in, in Paris. And we also did 100 BOMA circles around the world, um, working on how do we really find that local sustainable innovation and impact. And we had prototypes and formulas on university campuses. 
And so BOMA was a systems change network and we were a year and a half in and things were going really well. And then a week after we launched our BOMA community around innovation, uh, COVID hit. And so it, it's been a really interesting experience. Um, what we did straight away off the bat is we, um, uh, we three weeks after the US shut down, we decided to show how agile we are. We had a, a partner in China, a BOMA country partner in China, and we decided to do a round the world summit around what we could learn from each other. Because in order to solve what we knew was a gl global problem, uh, we needed all these local inputs and we most certainly could learn from each other. And so we did two hours in every country. We actually had landed up having 20, uh, 12 countries, so 24 hours of programming. We landed up in Palo Alto with Larry Brilliant, um, Peter Diamandes with Larry Brilliant is one of the top epidemiologists. And it we had BuzzFeed and a whole lot of great sponsors and it got a lot of visibility. Three weeks later, we decided to do something similar, but on mental health and COVID. And by that stage, everybody had an online offering. So it became very clear very quickly that this was not gonna be a revenue stream. And if we were gonna do online products, we needed to have local distribution partners to get us through a lot of the noise that was happening online. And so we created what we call our BOMA studio where we host sessions like this, but they run by our nine um, country partners around the world around thought leadership and what do we need to do to build a more intentional, intelligent future. And so our BOMA studio exists today for our digital space. And we really use it for brand building, thought leadership, and um, multiple uh, local inputs around um, what do we have to do in this very complicated time. So, and then we started to focus on, well, how in COVID do we really create a business model that would sustain us through the next two years? Because, um, you know, when it's, we projected out that in, 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 in March that this was gonna be at least a two year cycle. Um, and so we started to migrate all our training around what you need to know and who you need to be online. And so, you know, I don't think I need to tell all of you, but it's been a very complicated time for everybody. And um, COVID has really magnified the weaknesses in our systems. It's shown us how much more vulnerable we are than we ever expect and, and how much more connected we are than we ever imagined. And so we know that our leadership is having a really hard time navigating this disruption. And it's not only COVID, we layer on top of that climate change, geopolitical change, technology change, social change. And that's the reality our CEOs are facing this moment in. And so when we looked at you know, our, our big grand vision from two years ago, we decided where we really needed to focus is how do we help leaders of today not only navigate this moment, but if we look to 2050, what kind of leaders do we really need in order to get us there? And what do they need to be learning to get there? And so, you know, 79% of, of CEOs right now are saying they're completely reevaluating their purpose. Um, you know, we have a trillion in costs predicted to rise from inaction to climate change um, in the top Fortune 500 companies. You know, 50% of the world economy will be massively affected by automation in the next few years. And so it's really clear in order to go from where we are today in the middle of COVID to where we need to be, we need a different kind of leader, but more importantly, we need to figure out how we train these leaders so that they step in and work on not only what they need to know, but who they need to be. And so I'll bring up a few slides. I, um, you know, I, I, Elan, you can go to the, you can, you can actually play the video, Elan, because I think that'll set the mood for where we want to go with BOMA. So if we can bring up the first slide. So I think we all, so leadership is really at this moment where they are reevaluating their purpose and they need a roadmap to get from where they are today to where they need to go. And so BOMA is this um, decentralized educational company that is really creating a platform for future leaders around what they need to know and who they need to be to navigate through this very disruptive time. So um, as I said, BOMA is this early stage disruptive corporate training and events network where we're gathering the world's best minds to deliver customized content through the scalable decentralized platform. And we really focused on um, 
digital training right now. We're disrupting what leaders need to know and who they need to be to lead in the future. And we're doing this through our leadership programs, our customized corporate training, our workshops, and we have corporate clubs around the world. We also have digital summits and our digital studio, which I mentioned before. And how are we doing this to be the front runner and how we think about what leaders need to know and who they need to be to lead 20 years or 30 years from now. We're really using the best minds that we have access to through our former networks. As I said, many of the people in our network have been both part of TED and Singularity and other global networks that really think differently about thought leadership. And so we're really using these um, thought leaders that we have access to around the world to deliver superior access to global talent and content. And this is all presented on a decentralized platform which allows our model to scale. So it's not only um, targeting CEOs or C-suite leadership, but it is really able to scale throughout the organization in a moment in time where it is really important to create systemic change that everybody in the organization does get educated. Sorry, next, next slide, please. And so what really makes BOMA different um, in, a, in, a, in a traditional corporate training space, it's, there's normally a, a really a limitation on subject matter and geography. Many of traditional um, corporate training models, I'm sure all of you have been through some kind of corporate training, tend to be quite dry and not always well designed. Um, there always is um, a, often they are outdated, but there's often a focus on either hard skills or soft skills. And finally, often it's not locally relevant. They don't contextualize it in a way that it is relevant to the local audience. And so what BOMA is really doing differently, as I said, we have access to this incredible network of some of the best people around the world who really are thinking differently about systemic change, about some of our big global challenges, but also about what leaders need to know and who they need to be to lead in, in the future. And um, we're really thinking about this training and how we can um, really make it up to date, mo modular and very local. And we're also working on a holistic format of what you need to know and who you need to be and really playing at the intersection. And finally, everything we deliver is delivered in this very decentralized way about our partners who I've worked with for the last 15 years around the world that are highly localizing it for that current audience. Uh, next slide, please. And so I touched a little bit on this earlier on, but many CEOs are saying that great corporate training or learning would be a game changer. And that um, they are at a point where they are reassessing the, their, their purpose. And so um, BOMA is really focusing at this intersection for these, these leaders on both what they need to know and who they need to be in order to be a future forward looking organization. And in addition to the what you need to know, which is the innovation, sustainability, global trends, and really how do we create companies that care about people, purpose, and profit, it's also about who you need to be. So as a leader, you need the courage to make those changes. You need to create a um, environment that is ethical. You need to have your leadership understand why they, why they have to make the right ethical choices and why that is important to humanity in this moment in time. And they have to be compassionate. And so it's very much also about the um, building out the muscle to be a very different kind of leader in order to make the, cha the hard changes and the make the hard choices that we all know we need to make in order to drive a more sustainable future for humanity. Next slide. I touched on this as well. So we really are looking at our partners in our network. Each one of them has deep connections to amazing people around the planet. And what we're doing with our curriculum is really thinking about how we can take this expertise, these, these years of um, <coughs> research and study of these key people and download their thought, their thought leadership into these imminently tra trainable modules with impeccable focus on experience design. So when you come out of a BOMA experience, it's like coming out of TED. You go, wow, I've learned so much and I cannot wait to go back in and learn more. And you're learning this from the best minds who have the ability to think really deeply about where we need to go as the future of humanity in all these different sectors. And so we're building out this library of modules that is 
Um, we create with our experts and thought leaders around the world that they are digitally delivered through facilitators with, again, impeccable attention to experience design. So it's fun and interactive for the teams around the world that are taking um, these learning journeys. Next slide. So um, this is the competitive landscape. I'm gonna skip over this. Um, we have a global network, as I said, is currently in nine countries. And by the end of next year, we will be in 15 countries. And these are just our country partners. We also have community partners that are working with us on the identifying the bottom-up in innovation. Next slide. I have three founding partners. Um, each of these individuals um, comes out of a um, long history of entrepreneurship and um, they've had successful exits. Um, my partner Kyla has built successful training companies, but she also brought TEDx to New Zealand and Singularity to New Zealand, Australia. Um, and Stefan and Michelle are both, um, Michelle has actually a background in um, computer science and engineering. And he has founded a lot of um, technology companies as well as created a platform for the Chef Evole around local innovation. Next slide. Um, yeah, I think we can get rid of this presentation, this slide. Thank you. Next slide. So again, um, you know, BOMA has been around for two years and the, at the vision of BOMA was really um, about systemic change. How do we create a system of decentralized partners? We know that so many of our big problems on the planet right now are deeply interconnected and that we need this local um, input in order to, to, to bubble up, to change. We also need both top down and bottom up. And so BOMA was really seen as this decentralized network of local partners that was driving um, a, a open source change to how do we create a better operating system for the future of humanity. And going back to the beginning of the presentation, the word BOMA actually does come from ancient Africa. The BOMA was the enclosure where the tribe would come together to have their card discussions about their shared future and take action. And so at BOMA, we, mm -hmm. if you go to a modern, a modern day safari, you sit in the BOMA and you break bread and you tell stories. And we're really play, playing on this um, notion that the world needs new agile emergent circles coming together in order to drive a more intentional and intelligent future. And so the, the network was set up in this way that is de a series of decentralized partners that are both country partners and community partners. And, you know, at, at, at the outset, we've done a series of large scale events, as I mentioned, that are focused on big global challenges. Um, we pivoted to do a series of online round the world events, as well as a BOMA studio. And then where our real focus is right now is through COVID is foc focusing on how do we really create a, a large library of modules with some of the big best minds on the planet that will make learning journeys not only completely um, compelling, but also really focus on future leadership and what they need to know and who they need to be in order to design the world that we all know we want. And so, um, you know, we're working with a lot of corporate partners already. We have, we have clients like Capgemini and others who we're working on, on building out their, their digital training platforms and um, we'll continue to work on building out our um, library of modules around the people that we really respect and who are thinking about um, some of these large global challenges and what it looks like to be a um, sort of responsible leader in the future. Next slide. In fact, Ilan, I think we can go to the, um, the, the end and I'll just give you a snapshot of some of BOMA's work. We are in the middle of a fundraise. Um, we've raised 1.65 million. We're um, going to be raising 4 million in total, um, but I'd rather focus on some of the work we've done. As I said, we, we're, do, we did an event um, that was very much focused across stakeholder event in New Zealand on the future of food and food security. As, as you know, that's their primary industry. We're gonna be doing another one in May in person um, as of now, because New Zealand is not shut down. And we're also planning on doing one um, in the US um, towards the end of the year. Next slide.
Uh, this was a event that we did in France for the top CEOs and, and corporate executives in France around, uh, this was last summer, around how do we think about um, designing an inclusive, sustainable future. Next slide. This is a summit we did in Germany that was very much focused on exponential techs and ethics and AI. Next slide. This is just ready to give you a sense of some of the work we're doing around the world. Um, we've also had a series of community events. This was our launch in Paris um, after Davos, where we had 3,000 attendees and these BOMA circles that we started around the world. And then the final slide just shows you some of the work we are doing with our corporate clients, which is um, how do we work on building out um, digital training programs that really are focused on how do we um, does, um, how do we work with with leaderships and big companies to think about how they should lead in the future. Uh, this is a slide. This is just a slide of the event we did um, during COVID, and this is the work we're doing with some of our corporate clients. And so I'm going to stop there. Sorry for the glitches and the technology. It's just a bit slow. How do you go through the selection process? Um, you know very well that many people that are on the internet, they are basically interested in their own who they are rather than basically changing the world. Yeah, sure. So for starters, everybody in our network has spent a lot of time in the TED ecosystem, has spent a lot of time in the Singularity ecosystem, and it's also curated very credible, large scale initiatives in each of their countries. So we have a good starting point where we have access and connections to some people who have already been pre-vetted by other organizations. We also have a selection criteria and we have a whole series of selection criteria, including what they've published, you know, where they come from, making sure there's diversity and inclusion and how we're selecting, as you know, in many cases, you know, if, you, if I look at a lot of the work some of my former employees have done, you know, you'll look at a lineup in they doing an event, one of them is doing an event in Brazil in six weeks, and it was all men, right? And so we really try and pay attention to sort of this sortition like perspective on how do we create real diversity within our speakers, but also how to make sure that they are credible. And then finally, what is the narrative they're putting out there in the world when it comes to the future of humanity? And is it one that um, we think will help design a more inclusive, uh, a more um, transparent, a more ethical world. And so, you know, we did an event actually the last three days with Cap Gemini, and we had the wonderful Juan Enriquez who just wrote a book on right and wrong. He was a part of that event. And he's really looking at technology and the evolution of technology and the ethics around the evolution of technology, right? And so, that's an example of somebody we'd work with where we'd take um, their years of research and create modules that would then help inform some of the thought leadership as um, as we roll this out inside of companies. Noticed, I also noticed that you focused on uh, New Zealand, Germany uh, and France, which are two different very different, um, very different populations and they approach things very, very differently. Uh, so I would say that probably at the present time, uh, New Zealand uh, is the foremost uh, country that is developing or trying to develop new approaches and not relying on old um, methods of uh, governing their populations. So, um, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's, it's really exciting because we have a Chinese partner. We have a partner in New Zealand. We have Germany, France, Brazil, Chile, and a couple of other countries. But I think what's exciting about New Zealand is you can rapid prototype things. If you want access, like, you know, we really wanted to create a, a series of initiatives that were cross stakeholder. You can easily get access to the ministers and everybody throughout the ecosystem to show the possibility if you really have cross stakeholder um, you know, conversations and, and, and drive different kinds of inputs through a cross stakeholder approach. And so, which obviously is much more difficult to do in, in a big country. 
Yeah, uh, actually, we do have a member uh, from New Zealand that's uh, on our board or on. So uh, I agree with you. We have another one of our board members, uh, Richard Whiteford, that would like to ask a question. Richard, go right ahead. Yes, I would. I was wondering how you get um, these ideas from um, these, these uh, special people. And I was quite impressed with uh, some of your list of people. Uh, but how do you get that? from their minds to the minds of the practitioners, uh, particularly if practitioners are not all that willing to, to um, you know, think on modern terms, you know? Yeah. yeah, so the first, I'll take the first part of the question is, how do you get at this? So we have a, 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 the person who did a lot of the work in both bringing TED and Singularity to New Zealand and Australia, his background is in curriculum development, but we're taking a very different approach where we, really wanted to make it about the experience. And so, as I said, you wanna feel like you went to day at TED after you come out of one of these trainings that we're gonna we, we putting people through. And so the how is we're creating these modules with these very compelling people that are also very credible and then use training people to deliver it. So it, it does scale in a way that otherwise wouldn't be possible, right? Um, and the closest I can analogy I can make to that, although she does it in person, not she doesn't do it digitally yet that I know is Brene Brown, where Brene, Brene Brown had her, um, you know, her, her curriculum on, on courage and she trained trainers to, de to deliver that in person, right? And so she scaled it that way. We're doing it digitally, not like she did it, but we, there, there are some similarities. Um, and then we, you're right, we have to meet companies and practitioners and people where they are, right? We're not trying to we, 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 can't, we, we have to meet them where they are on this curve of how do we, I was at Davos, many CEOs are now aware of where we have to go in order to drive a more inclusive, sustainable future. They don't all know how to get there. There isn't, a, and co, you, you put COVID on top of that and you know there's so much disruption and then there's, there's all the cracks that we're seeing through COVID. And so, you know, I think a lot of these CEOs are looking in this moment for solutions to help them navigate this moment, but also help educate um, their layer, the, the C-suite layer and the permafrost and the layer underneath them. And so we are working with people who are open to this idea that the world is in a complicated place. We need, um, we, we need a, a different kind of a perspective to drive big companies forward to create the sustainable future we need. And the companies that have a small crack open to allow to and want to have that conversation and want to be educated differently, we will step into, and we will. I'd look be really, I'd be really interested in, in getting involved in this. Um, I didn't see a, a website um, on your slides or anything like that. How does one get in touch with you? Yes, yeah, so um, I guess we can follow up after this. I, I'm putting the our website in the chat. Um, I'm at I'm Laura at. So you can just email me. That's my email. And Ilan is on as well. And her email is, and she can send you other resources if you, uh, that should be global. It should be an L at the end. But um, so we can, we can share any resources you need or want with regards to anything we're doing. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, um, Richard. And uh, we have a question from one of our students. How are you coping with COVID-19? Are you having any difficulties at the moment? Yeah, I mean, COVID-19 <laughs> has been challenging for every CEO and any CEO that said no would be lying. Um, but, you know, as I say, the vision of BOMA was this decentralized network of partners and it was meant to be a systems change model where everything was being done in person. So we had these big events cross stakeholder that would meet in person to drive innovation and change. We went into companies and we worked with them on, um, you know, the future of leadership. And then we had this bottom up model that was like TEDx, but for innovation and overnight everything shut down, you couldn't meet in person. And so, yes, it has been a huge challenge. And I think we've navigated it really well. I've had to let go of my big vision for now, which is hard for me because I like to think big and I'm all about how do we build a better world and putting me in any smaller box is, is not who I am, but I'm, I'm working on it. 
And so the focus is we've moved all our corporate training to a digital platform. We're building out this new library of modules with people we've worked with who we respect. And we've got some great clients. And so we're, we're moving forward. I'm also fundraising, which my background is not my background. And so fundraising over Zoom has been hugely challenging to the degree that there are days where I do feel like I just want to give up. But other than that, everything's good, but it is challenging. It is COVID. And also I'll add the caveat that as a female founder, 3% of money raised in the US goes to um, women. And so we're a, you know, a B Corp on the one side and we also have a nonprofit and I'm also how to navigate what work we're doing in the B. Initially, we just wanted to be a B Corp where we're for profit driving positive impact. But from a fundraising standpoint, you know, you, you often leave a lot of money on the table if you, you don't put some of that into the foundation. So, cause you can't raise money from certain people unless you have a foundation. So it's been complicated the last five, six months. Question is, do you think the younger generation should learn about BOMA as a curriculum in order to learn ethics and leaderships from a young age? In particular, at a time when technology is the way the young generation is getting educated. So yes, my passion for BOMA would be that we land up being a multi-billion dollar company where we give away our curriculum to young people and to people who don't have access in the developing world so that they can also have access to some of the best minds on the planet thinking about how we should govern in a transparent, uh, respectful, incredible way. And so in a perfect world where BOMA was existing and running and generating the kind of success and revenue I'm hoping, I would, I, the, my passion is how do we really um, give access to the edu to to, uh, to great education to those people who don't have great education. And I'm a firm believer that in this moment in time, that we have the tools and the ability for everybody to have access to some of the great minds on the planet in education. It's just a matter of will. And yes, you know, if you think back to the '60s or to you know Milton Freeman and his um, curriculum around the. the the main responsibility of a organization is shareholder value. We have to start moving away from that, um, that principle. And we have to move towards a more um, stakeholder driven um, narrative. And so it's all about the young people who are the up and coming leaders and the upcoming CEOs understand that why we need to get there. And then when they are, do step into a position of leadership of power that they have the courage to make the right decisions, right? So if you were the if you were the founder of YouTube in 2010 and you saw that the way you were going to drive the maximum amount of views on your on YouTube was if you were going to create an algorithm that would help elevate sexual content and you had a choice in that moment to do it or not do it, you know you you know why you shouldn't do it versus what YouTube did which was elevated and then had to deal with it on the back end, right? So we want to create a framework of, of, of education that does educate the next generation, that does educate um, young people as to what are the right ethical decisions to make and why as we move into a more and more complicated world that is changing more and more rapidly because of exponential technologies. Uh, comparison of the current avenues of vulner uh, vulnerability. To what extent do you uh, see the current vulnerability of governments in basically changing their methods of thinking and functioning to incorporate what is best for the world. Yeah, I think governments are a difficult one because governments are not necessarily motivated by what's best for the world. They are motivated by a whole lot of other um, drivers and at the very end it's what's best for the world but I think what is what, what the virus has made clear is that if we don't find a way to all work together on some of these big global problems we are not going to solve any of them and so we have to build new systems where governments understand no matter what they have a role to play and it has to be a role with a sense of urgency in some of these big global problems now the reality of the governments waking up to get there has, again, that the pressure has to come from a multi-stakeholder approach. I don't think it's gonna come from, it's gotta come from 
you know, the bottom up from protest and from the top down from some very smart people who can put pressure on the government. It, there, there have to be a lot of different driving factors to try to get the government to change. And even within that framework, as we've seen in the US in the last four years, you get one bad apple and that doesn't work. So I think, I, I, you know, I can't speak for government. I, there's a reason we started with corporates because it's very hard to change the complexity and influence the complexity of governments. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't talk for all governments, but most certainly right now we've seen a rise in sort of the um, alpha despot male in a lot of governments. And so, you know, you look at New Zealand and the leadership there, and if every country on the planet um, mirrored that kind of leadership, this, this world would be a very different place, right? And so the question is, firstly, I don't always think the, 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 the people with the, the, the compassion are the ones that land up rising to the top levels of government or the ones that have the, the kind of leadership qualities that would allow us to build that kind of world. And so the question becomes, how do we start educating people who could possibly rise to these leadership positions? And there are people doing that and it's part of what BOMA is working on. And then, you know, longer term, you know, how do we incentivize great people to run for office? And so we know that the caliber of people that are moving into these offices aren't corrupt and they are compassionate and they are, they have the qualities we need to be great leaders. And how do we create a society that values that? Because right now it's feeling in the US very bifurcated. Join our BOMA programs and you can learn how to be courageous, ethical, compassionate, and, um, but also learn about some of the other things that you need to know um, in order to be, make the right decisions in the future. Well, all I can tell you that it's, uh, your BOMA program really sounds, if you are going to be able to expand it throughout the world, I think it could be extremely beneficial uh, because you do seem to focus on the right requirements in building new leadership. So, um, Thank you very much for being with us.